This is Audible. Hachette Audio presents How to American, an immigrant's guide to disappointing your parents. Written and read by me, Jimmy O. Yang, with a foreword from Mike Judge. Includes a bonus PDF of photos, cool photos. Hey guys, thanks for buying this book. According to the the audio engineer here, I'm the first Asian comedian that's ever recorded a book. Or I don't know, first Asian comedian I ever worked with. But this is fun. Thank you. Again, I don't know if you're Asian or not, but either way, you're helping the cause of putting more Asian entertainers on the map. And this story is for everyone, man. And some of this I'm gonna improvise, like I am doing right now. This is not in the book. So you can only hear this if you're on the audiobook. So if your friend has a book, tell him to buy the audiobook too. Double the paycheck for me. That'd be great. Now, a lot of you guys are wondering, oh my god, this is Jing Yang from Silicon Valley, but he talks like a normal person. Of course I do. It's called acting, you people. But some of this I'll read in character. And some of these I'll read in other people's character. So hopefully you guys will enjoy this journey with me as I read to you my own life. Man. This is the most narcissistic thing I've ever done, but hopefully you enjoy it as much as I do. Forward, written by Mike Judge. When we first cast Jimmy O. Yang in Silicon Valley, I didn't know anything about him. I just had a good feeling about him based on his audition. I had no idea that the accent he was doing was not the way he normally spoke and that his persona was very different from that of the character he was playing in our show, Jin Yang. I also didn't know that he had graduated with a degree in economics from UCSD, the same school I graduated from many years earlier, or that he graduated in 2009, the year that I gave the commencement speech, and that he had attended it, and apparently had been somewhat inspired to go into comedy by what I said. I found all this out after we had been working on set for a couple days. Jimmy and I hit it off right away and became fast friends. As you'll notice when you read this book, he's a funny guy, with an interesting and unique perspective on things in this country. You don't often hear the stories about Chinese immigrants. At least it seems that way to me. I think maybe it's because we Americans just don't ask. Jimmy and I hung out quite a bit, and I became interested in his story. It's an interesting one. He's had quite a journey. From being a child ping-pong star in Hong Kong, to coming to America and becoming a stand-up comedian, achieving his dream of being a strip club DJ, only to discover how sad and depressing that is to becoming a successful TV and movie actor. Jimmy has really experienced America like few have. When we were shooting the first season of Silicon Valley, we had no idea if the show would become a hit and go on for more seasons, or if it would flop and be quickly forgotten. We were all just working away, trying our best to make it good and hoping it would work. Jimmy always had a great optimism about him, and when we'd talk about the show, it would make my cynical ass believe that maybe it could be a hit. And then it was. And as we went on to do additional seasons, Jimmy's character quickly became a cornerstone of the show. He also became my favorite character to write for around season three. There's something great and stoic about Jin Yang that Jimmy embodies perfectly. I know that sometimes language barrier jokes can be considered easy by comedy snobs, but Jimmy makes it all work in a really great way. I was already getting a sense that Jin Yang was becoming a favorite character on the show, but it really hit me when we were doing a panel at Comic-Con San Diego in 2016. We were in one of the big rooms with a couple thousand people. I'm bad with crowd numbers, but it was at least that, maybe three or four thousand. 
and someone asked if there was going to be more Jin Yang next season. This was followed by thunderous applause, which was followed by even more thunderous applause when I said yes. Jimmy was officially famous. Part of my inspiration for the show Silicon Valley came from back when I was working as an engineer. And at my first engineering job, I had an Iranian friend who worked there too, who said something that always stuck with me. He said that this really is the land of opportunity, but most Americans just don't see it because they're simply too used to it. They don't appreciate it, and they don't take advantage of it as much as people who move here from other countries do. When you come to America from a place like Iran, you get here and you just marvel at all the opportunities and the freedom. Reading this book, you get the sense that Jimmy had that same experience, and he did not waste the opportunity at all. He worked his ass off for everything he has. Jimmy's experience is uniquely American. You just don't hear these kinds of stories from other countries. Okay, somebody slap me. I'm getting too patriotic. Here's something I'll never forget about Jimmy. Before the first season of Silicon Valley had aired, Jimmy and I were sitting at the bar at a restaurant in Santa Monica. Now, when I'm out with him, we are often interrupted by fans who recognize him and want to take selfies. I was asking him about China. He was saying that if you're an ordinary American and you go to China, it's like being a movie star. Everyone stares at you and wants to be around you. He said it's the same if an American goes to Cuba. Then he paused for a second, looked down at his drink, and said, There's nowhere I can go. Well, Jimmy, now there's nowhere you can't go without being recognized like a star. Welcome to America, Jimmy O. Yang. Mike Judge Prologue! I eat the fish. I said this to my roommate in my thick Chinese accent. I know you eat the fish, but when you clean the fish, you can't just leave the fish head and guts and shit in the sink because the whole house smells like a bait station. So you got to put it in the trash, then take the trash out. Do you understand? My big curly-haired American roommate explained to me, pointing at the leftover fish parts in the sink. I stared at him, confused. And I replied, yes. I eat the fish. Motherfuck! He howled in complete frustration. The whole crew burst out in laughter. That was my second day on the set of Silicon Valley, an HBO show created by one of my comedy heroes, Mike Judge. It was my big break in Hollywood. My character, Jing Yang, is a fresh-off-the-boat Chinese immigrant whose struggle with the English language often leads to comical misunderstandings with his buffoonish roommate, Ehrlich Bachman played by the impeccable T.J. Miller. It felt natural for me to play this character. I was once a fresh-off-the-boat Chinese immigrant myself. I was Jing Yang. When my family immigrated to America from Hong Kong, I was a 13-year-old boy who looked like an 8-year-old girl. I didn't even speak enough English to understand the simplest American slang. On my first day of school in America, a girl came up to me and said, What's up? I stared at her, confused. I had never heard this term before. She repeated, What's up? I looked up into the sky to check what is up there. There wasn't anything. I looked back down at her and I replied, I don't know. She finally realized I was either foreign or severely mentally handicapped. So she explained, What's up means how are you doing? Oh, okay. I'm up. Thank you. Then someone in the distance screamed out, Heads up! I turned to reply, thinking it was another American greeting. Instead, I was greeted by a weird oblong object flying right at me and hitting me straight in the gut. I later learned that was an American football. This wasn't an episode of Silicon Valley. This was my life. Now, that was a cool prologue, huh? I didn't want to write a prologue, but the publisher said it would look super official, so... There you go. I don't, I barely know what prologue means.
But there will be an epilogue also, because we're professionals here. All right, let's get into it. Chapter 1. How to Asian. My life growing up in Hong Kong was like a bad stereotype. I played the violin, I was super good at math, and I played ping pong competitively. In China, people take ping pong seriously. It's not just a drunken frat house game. Ping pong is a prestigious national sport. The ping pong champs in China are national heroes like Brett Favre without the dick pics. Everyone, from your five-year-old neighbor to your 70-year-old aunt, knows how to slice up some six spins in ping pong. My parents signed me up from ping pong classes early on. I had quick feet and lightning backhand. Soon, I was competing in the 13 and under Hong Kong Championship Leagues. I always had good form, but I was always smaller and weaker than the other kids. My dad would give me a pep talk before every match. Jimmy, even though you're short, even though you're weak, the other kid is way better than you. You are going to do okay. He wasn't exactly Vince Lombardi, but thanks, Dad. My tiny size eventually paid off when I was asked to test out a brand new line of ping pong tables with adjustable heights. They invited pro players to play with the kids and it was broadcasted on the local news. It was a big deal, man. And that was my big TV debut. I was 10 years old. My perfect form and tiny stature made for an adorable display at the ping pong table. The news camera found its way to me and gave me a personal close-up interview. The reporter asked me, How do you like these new tables? I like them, because you can adjust them to be shorter, and I am short. It was so cute. The next day, the news station called my family and asked me to come back for a full studio interview. This kid was a fucking star. I went on the show with my dad and crushed that interview, man. There were three cameras in the studio and I was a natural, swiveling my head from A camera to C camera, charming seven million people in Hong Kong with every line I uttered. Everyone thought I was the star ping pong prodigy. I became the coolest kid in my school and the pride and joy of my family. Everyone called me the Golden Boy TV star. I felt like a celebrity. A few months later, I competed in a youth tournament representing my school. I was the favorite to win it all. But I faltered in front of the whole school. I lost 21-3 to to a no-name newcomer. Two matches in a row. Everybody was shocked. It was like Mike Tyson getting knocked out by Buster Douglas. The boy they once believed in was just a fraud. I couldn't back up my hype with my skills. I was definitely more of a looker than a player. I was an imposter destined to be an actor. I've always felt like an outsider, even as a Chinese kid growing up in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was a thriving British colony with its own government. And people in Hong Kong often looked down at their neighbors from mainland China. Even though I was born in Hong Kong, my parents were mainlanders from Shanghai. I would speak Cantonese in school, Shanghainese back home, and watch TV shows in Mandarin. These three Chinese dialects sounded as different as Spanish and Italian. My schoolmates in Hong Kong always call me Shanghai boy. I had to stand up for myself when kids made fun of me for speaking to my parents in Shanghainese, wearing clothes from Shanghai, and eating the Shanghainese fruit I brought to school. I didn't mind teasing, but I always felt out of place, even in a city I was born in. This turned out to be some early practice on fitting in when we immigrated to America. Everyone in Hong Kong has a legal Chinese name and an English nickname. My legal name is a four-character Chinese name. My family name is a rare two-character last name, Ouyang. And my given name is Wan Chen, or in Cantonese it will be Man Seng, which means 10,000 successes. It's a hopeful name that is sure to set me up for failure. No matter how successful I become, I can never live up to my parents' 10,000 ambitions. Jimmy was my English nickname given to me by my parents. I grew up in a tight-knit nuclear family with my parents and an older brother. My mom's name was Amy because it sounded close to her Shanghainese nickname, Ami. My dad named himself Richard because I want to be rich, he explained to me. And my brother was named Roger 
after my parents fell in love with Roger Moore's portrayal of 007. Roger Oyang never liked his English name. He thought it sounded like an old white guy. So he changed his English name to Roy, an old black guy's name. I asked my parents why they named me Jimmy. They didn't really have an answer. My dad said, it just sounded pretty good. My mom is a fashionable lady who is too ambitious to be just a housewife. She was the stay-at-home mom turned career woman, becoming the general manager at a high-end clothing store in Hong Kong, aptly named Dapper. Mom is a people person, but she is always very blunt. It's definitely a cultural thing. Asian ladies will tell you exactly what is wrong with your face in front of your face, as if they were helping you. I always have to brace myself when I visit my parents. My mom often greets me with a slew of non-constructive criticisms. Jimmy, why is your face so fat? Your clothes look homeless, and your hair makes you look like a girl. After 30 years of this, my self-image is now a fat, homeless lesbian. Mom has always been a shrewd shopper. She's not cheap, but it's all about finding a good deal. I once bought a $50 t-shirt at full price. She almost had a stroke. Jimmy, you spent a $50 on that shirt? Are you crazy? I can buy five shirts in China for $10. Then my dad tested out the quality of the material by rubbing his thumb and index finger on the shirt. Not a, even a 100% cotton. Garbage. It took me a long time to come to terms with buying anything outside of Ross. My dad is a sharp businessman and entrepreneur. He started a thriving medical equipment business in the early 90s in Hong Kong and then later became a financial advisor in Merrill Lynch when we came to America. He's the ultimate critic. He's a food critic, a movie critic, and a people critic. Every restaurant we go to, he complains about the food, the service, and even the utensils. He's like a walking Yelp review, and everything was like one star. The beef is a tougher than a piece of cardboard. This is worse than the crap I ate during the Communist Revolution. How are you going to call yourself a high-end restaurant if you use disposable chopsticks? I feel like I'm eating a Panda Express. The waiter here is such an asshole. Why does he have red hair? He's 50 years old. He looks like a degenerate gambler. The only restaurant he never complains about is Carl's Jr. He can devour two $6 burgers in one sitting, an impressive fee for anyone especially a 70-year-old Chinese dude. Food is the glue in every Chinese family, and ours was no different. Chinese people are the biggest foodies in the world. There's a saying in China, people put food first. We took dinner very seriously. There are always four homemade Chinese dishes and a gourmet soup du jour with a side of freshly made rice. Dad was serious about dinner time. Every night at seven, he would yell at the top of his lungs, Come eat dinner! If we were a minute late, he would storm into me and my brother's FIFA game. Do you want to eat, or do you want to starve to death? Dinner! Now! We wouldn't dare hit another button on the controller. Dad was the head chef of the family. He specialized in Shanghainese cuisine, like his perfect recipe for red braised pork. Every day, Dad got off work at four and started cooking at five. Mom was a decent cook, too, but every time she made dinner, my dad would criticize her cooking. Amy, this is too watery. You need to boil the mushroom in high heat, not simmer in low heat. He relegated her cooking duties to an occasional simple tofu dish. Dad was actually a bit embarrassed by his own cooking prowess. In the patriarchal Chinese culture, the woman is supposed to be the stay-at-home housewife and do all the cooking. Once in a while, Dad made sure to remind me, don't end up cooking in the kitchen like me. That should be a woman's job. But what am I supposed to do? I cook better than your mom. Some might call this misogyny. In my family, it was irony. My brother and I were responsible for cooking the rice, and there was nothing that made my dad angrier than fucking up the rice. The amount of water I put in the rice cooker could mean life or death. Cooking rice is an art form. If I put too little water in the cooker, the rice would be raw inside. If I put too much water in the cooker, 
the rice became a mushy porridge. It was a lot of pressure to make it right because the entire five-course meal my dad whipped up depended on the consistency of the rice. Every night, I felt like the pit crew member who had to change the tire of a Formula One race car. It was a thankless job, but if I fucked it up, I blew the entire race for everyone. I'll be nervously sitting at the dinner table, waiting for my dad to take the first bite of the rice. If it was cooked right, there'll be no compliments. But if it was not cooked right, Motherfucker! My dad would scream at the top of his lungs in Shanghainese. This rice is raw! Who made a rice today? And I'll shamefully raise my incapable hand. It was always my fault. My brother cooked the rice perfectly every time. We never had space for a proper pet growing up in the small apartments in Hong Kong. When I was five, my brother and I got a couple of tadpoles, and we managed to raise them into frogs. That was our puppy. Then when I turned eight, my dad surprised us with a few fluffy, warm-blooded pets. He came home with three pet chicks. They were the cutest little baby chickens. We put them in the spacious cage on our twentieth-floor balcony. With a sweet view of the city, we weren't allowed to take them out and play with them because their pecks were rather painful, and I'm pretty sure that's how Asian people get the bird flu. But we got to pet them through the cage, and I used to stare at their cute, fluffy yellow feathers for hours. We even gave them English nicknames. My favorite was Gary. He was the smallest but the most energetic. He reminded me of myself. Watching him grow was like watching a tadpole slowly transform into a frog. I was so proud of our progress. One day, I came home from school to visit little Gary and his friends, only to find the cage was empty. I panicked. I checked around the balcony, the living room, and the bedrooms, and I couldn't find them anywhere. Oh my God! Did they fall off the balcony? Then I went up to my dad in the kitchen. Dad, where is Gary? Oh, he's a right here. Dad pointed to the walk in front of him, sizzling with fried chicken. And then I realized Gary and his friends were never meant to be our pets; they were just farm-to-table dinner. I felt sick to my stomach. I was sure I would never be able to love again after that. I cried through dinner that night, but I have to admit, Gary was delicious. Watching American action movies was the thing to do in Hong Kong. We're obsessed with all the larger-than-life American action heroes: Arnold, Stallone, Seagal, Van Damme, and all the other white dudes. We watch Terminator 2 every other weekend on our VCR. The opening sequence with the killer robot revolution scared the shit out of me, but then Arnold would drop out of the sky naked and save us all. One of our favorite local celebrities was Stephen Chow, a comedy legend in Hong Kong who later became an international star with Shaolin Soccer and Kung Fu Hustle. Stephen created a genre of comedy films in Hong Kong called Mo Lei Tao. Translated from Cantonese, it literally means nonsense. He makes slapstick humor with his signature deadpan demeanor, much like Leslie Nielsen in the classic Jerry Zucker films like Airplane and The Naked Gun. Stephen was my hero, and his Moleto films were my first comedy inspirations. My favorite film of his was From Beijing with Love, a spoof of the 007 series featuring Stephen playing a bumbling low-end Chinese spy. The physical and prop humor were top-notch. The Chinese 007 pulls out a top-secret gadget kit. It is a mobile phone that is actually a shaver, a shaver that is actually a hair dryer, and a hair dryer that is in fact. A shaver. The creativity of these gags gave me some of my fondest childhood memories. Stephen Chow was my Hong Kong version of the Three Stooges, Laurel and Hardy, and Peter Sellers. And at this point, I inserted a super sweet family photo of us back when we were in Hong Kong. So if you want to see what Richard looks like, what Roger, aka Roy, my brother, looks like, and what my beautiful mom, Ami, aka Amy, looks like. Check it out on the bonus PDF that you downloaded alongside the audiobook. How to pursue your dreams with Asian parents. In America, people always tell me money can buy you happiness, 
Do what you love. In my Chinese family, my dad always tells me, pursuing your dreams is for losers. Doing what you love is how you become homeless. The most important values in American culture are independence and freedom. The most important values in Chinese culture are family and obedience. And by no choice of my own, I'm caught in between the two worlds. Having immigrated from Hong Kong to Los Angeles, I live my life in an often difficult duality. I grew up believing in the Chinese values my parents instilled in me, but I long for the American value of pursuing what I loved. I've always been jealous of American kids and their freedom to do whatever they want. It's so simple for them. They don't have to follow a different set of Chinese rules back home. They got to frolic around the neighborhood streets and play in the tree houses by themselves with no parental supervision. My mom didn't even let me cross the street by myself. I had to hold her hand until I was 14 years old. Asian parents are more protective than a lioness with a newborn cubs. Ever since we moved to America, I had to ask myself, am I Chinese or am I American? I was caught between the two cultures and their polarizing beliefs. Should I follow my family's rules and be an obedient Chinese son? Or should I follow my freedom and be an independent American man? Top 5 Chinese Rules Number 1. Respect your parents, your elders, and your teachers. Never talk back or challenge them under any circumstances. Number 2. Education is the most important thing. It's more important than independence, the pursuit of happiness, and sex. Number three, pay back your parents when you start working. We were all born with a student loan debt to our Asian parents. Asian parents' retirement plans are their kids. Number four, always call your elders uncle or auntie, even if they're not related to you. Never call them by their first names. Number five, family first, money second, pursue your dreams, never. Whenever I try to challenge my dad on his Chinese beliefs, he sternly put down the hammer. You never ever talk to your father like that. It's a disrespectful to challenge your father. I never dream of doing that to my father. How could I argue with that logic? So instead of forcing my parents to accept their American mindset, I quietly rebelled. I obeyed my parents' rules inside of our Chinese household while I pursued my dreams in the American world outside. I promised my parents I'll finish my college degree in economics, but then I turned down a job in finance to pursue a career in stand-up comedy after I graduated. My dad thought I was crazy, but I figured it was better to disappoint my parents for a few years than to disappoint myself for the rest of my life. I had to disappoint them in order to pursue what I loved. That was the only way to have my Chinese turnip cake and eat an American apple pie, too. When my parents found out I was frequenting comedy clubs, they prayed it was just a delusional phase I would grow out of. Bankers, doctors, and scientists are what make Asian parents proud. Being an artist in China is the peasant work of a lowly clown. Stand-up isn't even a thing in China. My parents still refer to stand-up comedy as talk show. My mom would ask me, So, you are doing your talk show tonight? Sure, just like Jay Leno. Whatever, I stopped correcting her after a while. The closest form of stand-up in traditional Chinese culture is a two-man act called xiangseng, or crosstalk. It's a life stage act usually made up of a big buffoonish character and a straight man doing sketch comedy routines often singing along to a rhythm. It's like Laura and Hardy meets Jay-Z in Mandarin. Pretty awesome. A few years ago, I finally mustered up the courage to invite my parents to my stand-up comedy show. It was at one of the nicest comedy clubs I'd ever performed in, Brad Garrett's Comedy Club inside the MGM in Las Vegas. When I was 10, my family and I stayed at the MGM on vacation from Hong Kong to Vegas. So surely, my parents would know this was a legitimate five-star establishment. I set them down at the best seat in the house and made sure all their food and drinks were taken care of. 
They were the VIPs, and I was the star that night. I had a killer set. Everyone in the audience were laughing head over heels. I finally proved to my parents that all the time I spent doing talk shows at comedy clubs wasn't in vain. After the show, my parents came out and saw the crowd of adoring fans surrounding me. They waited in line with everyone, and I made sure to take my time greeting each audience member so they could see just how loved I was in this stand-up world. When they finally reached the front of the line, my excited comedian friend Jack went up to my dad and asked him, So, what do you think of your son? He was great, right? No, he's not funny, my dad flatly replied. I don't understand. Jack's face dropped as he awkwardly looked over to me. But there were no tears in my eyes, not even a hint of surprise. Most people would have been devastated at their father's disapproval. But that was the exact answer I expected from my dad. I knew he wasn't going to understand stand-up. And I knew he was too honest to lie about how he felt. But I wasn't upset because the joke was on him. I spent the better half of my set making fun of him. This was exactly how I got my material. This exchange with my dad at the MGM would eventually make it into my set. When my dad finally watched an episode of Silicon Valley, he said, I don't think your stand-up is funny, but I think Silicon Valley is a very funny. You and your big white roommate are funny together. That's probably the nicest thing he'll ever say about my career. In a Chinese family, we we'll never say I love you. That was his equivalent of a crying father hugging his son after winning the state championship football game. I love you, son. I'm so proud of you. After all, that wasn't a full-on hater. He just didn't understand stand-up. But the dynamic between me and T.J. Miller on Silicon Valley was at the Shang Tsung two-man act that he grew up with in China. And my deadpan delivery was like the Stephen Chow movies we watched back in Hong Kong. Thanks, Dad. My dad is also an actor, but I didn't come from an acting legacy like Angelina Jolie and John Voight. Dad started acting after I did. When I finally started booking some roles, he said to me, If it's so easy, you can do it. I can do it, too. (laughs) Fine. I'll show him how hard this is. So I called my agent, Jane, the next day and asked if she'll be interested in signing my dad. Sure. I can use an old Asian guy in my roster, Jane said. Apparently, old Asian dudes are rare commodities in Hollywood. This would surely show him the trials and tribulations I had to go through to become an actor. I'll give it a month before he called it quits on these grueling auditions. Two weeks later, the old man started booking everything. He booked four out of his first six auditions, an unheard of success rate. My dad called me. I booked another one. (laughs) This is so easy. Why isn't everyone doing it? My dad was a natural, and I was a struggling actor. My plan completely backfired. God damn it. One of the roles he booked was playing a Chinese mob boss on a Chinese television show called Little Daddy. It was a meaty three-episode arc that shot in San Francisco. I didn't think much of it when he landed the role, assuming it was probably some second-tier production. Little Daddy became one of the most popular shows in China. It went on to sweep the hearts of a billion Chinese people. All of our relatives and family friends from China called and congratulated my dad on his brilliant performance. My aunt from Shanghai called him and exclaimed, Richard, you were so good in that role. Your son must have taken after you. I hope he succeeds like you. I fucked up. I really fucked this up. However, this apparent curse did eventually lead to an unlikely breakthrough for me. When my dad was killing it, As the hottest old Asian dude to hit Hollywood since Mr. Miyagi, I was scraping together small two-line parts on TV. Then my dad got an audition to be a scientist on one of my favorite TV shows. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It was a prominent role, and they were looking for an older actor to play a Mandarin-speaking scientist. I was so jealous of this opportunity, and my dad had never even heard of the show. When he called me the night before to run lines with him, it was painful, and I reluctantly agreed. 
It felt like a girl that you like calling you to tell you about another guy she likes. It was fucking painful. The next morning, Jane, our agent, gave me a call. She asked bluntly, "Hey, do you think your dad can handle this role? It's a lot of dialogue in Mandarin and English." Yeah, I think he'll be fine. That was half a lie. My dad might have been killing it in his earlier auditions, but they were mostly commercials and Chinese television. This was a comedic part on an American improvised comedy show. But hey, I vouch for my old man because, well, he's my old man. But Jane's agent's spidey sense was tingling. Maybe I'll call the casting director. And tell him to bring you in and read for the part instead. I couldn't say no, but I also didn't want to throw my dad under the bus, so I just passively responded, "Whatever works." Okay, I'll call him. Now I had less than two hours to prepare for the auditions for myself, and I also had to explain to my dad what happened. I called him right away to catch him before Jane does. Hey, Dad. Um. Uh. Listen, I think Jane wants me to audition for the part instead. I said sheepishly, waiting for him to punch me through the phone. I think that's good. I don't think I'm ready anyway. You would do better than me. Wow. I was surprised by this rare moment of vulnerability from my dad. This time, he ran the lines with me. I didn't have time to second guess myself when I went into the casting office. What I have to lose? This wasn't my part to begin with. Then I got the part, my biggest role yet on one of my favorite comedy shows, thanks to my dad. And it just so happened that particular episode, Flowers for Charlie, was written by the writers and executive producers of my favorite drama on TV, Game of Thrones. David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. I fanboyed super hard when we took a group photo with my favorite drama show creators and my favorite comedy show actors. David, Dan, the gang from Always Sunny, and I posed inside of the gang's pub. My dad becoming an actor led to one of the brightest highlights of my acting career. Oh, and here, if you want to look in your PDF, I got a super sweet photo of me, Dan Weiss. David Benioff and Always Sunny Gang, pretty cool. Three years later, I made my big screen debut in Patriots Day. I returned the favor and got my dad a role to play my dad in the movie. I know, right? That's awesome. I'm like a really good son. In the drama, I played a based on real life hero Danny Mang, the Chinese immigrant who was carjacked by the two terrorist brothers responsible for the Boston Marathon bombing. It was an honor to play Danny and get to know him in real life. Peter Berg was the director, and Mark Wahlberg was a producer and the star of the film. We made sure to portray every detail accurately to honor the real life victims and heroes of this tragedy. When Danny is first introduced in the film, he is facetiming his parents back home in Sichuan, China, speaking Mandarin. Originally, they cast a Chinese actor from Boston to play my dad. But unbeknownst to the American filmmakers, he spoke Mandarin with a thick Cantonese accent. Since I was born in Hong Kong to parents from mainland China, I was fluent in both dialects. Although the American audience wouldn't know the difference between Cantonese and Mandarin, it meant a lot to me to get it right for the Chinese-speaking viewers. He trusted me and agreed to recast the dad. And I asked him, "What about my dad? He's an actor." They flew my dad out to Boston the following week, and he played the scene brilliantly. It was a big deal for my dad to make his feature debut and share this experience with his son. One of the shining moments of my life was taking my parents to the Patriots Day premiere at the world-famous Grauman's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. We shared a red carpet with all the actors from the film: Mark Wahlberg, Kevin Bacon, J.K. Simmons. John Goodman and Michelle Monaghan. I couldn't believe I was part of this incredible cast, and so was my dad. It was wonderful to share the red carpet with my parents and sit by them when they watched my movie debut. The highlight of the night was the after party. My parents and I were seated across from Kevin Bacon, who is officially one degree separated from me. Sorry, I I know this joke is played out, but I but I had to. 
My dad kept nudging me in the arm and whispered, "Hey, you think we can take a picture with Kevin Bacon?" For once in my life, Dad, I'm on the same level with Kevin Bacon. Why can't I just enjoy this? I don't want to fanboy and take a picture. But I relented, knowing that selfie would mean a lot to my parents. So I went up to Kevin with my parents orbiting around me like two satellites. Hey, Kevin, nice to meet you. This was actually the first time we'd met since we didn't have any scenes together in the film. Hey, Mr. Bacon enthusiastically replied. Nice to meet you too. Hey, Kevin. Uh, these are my parents, and they're big fans of yours. Can we take a picture with you? Of course. Kevin was incredibly nice. He leaned in and said to my dad, "So, what do you think about your son in the movie? He was great, right?" Oh no, Kevin Bacon is about to make the same mistake Jack made outside of the comedy club in the MGM. I braced myself for my dad's response. Yes, yes, my son was in the movie, you know. I was in the movie too. My dad was too busy giving himself a plug instead of throwing me under the bus. Thank God. He took out his phone and snapped a selfie. Make sure you guys check that out on the PDF. All the years of disappointments from my parents seem to have vanished after the Kevin Bacon selfie. To see them happy was a bigger achievement than. Any accolade I could get from Mr. Bacon himself, I finally learned to embrace my dad as a fellow actor. But he'll never see me as an actor. I'll always be his son who fucked up the rice. Chapter two: How to immigrant. My family immigrated from Hong Kong to Los Angeles in 2000 when I was 13 years old. Thirteen is an awkward transitional period for any prepubescent teen. Not only did I have to learn about my newly found pubes, I had to move to a new country, learn a new language, and assimilate into a new culture. My parents moved to America hoping for a better college education for my brother and me. To most foreigners, America has the most prestigious universities and the best job opportunities for college graduates. Ironically. The only people who might disagree with that sentiment are people who actually live in America. I guess the grass is always greener, and the college diplomas are always shinier from a different country. Even though Hong Kong is one of the biggest metropolitan cities in the world, it just doesn't seem to have the same opportunities America has. You can make it big as a banker, a real estate developer, and a doctor in Hong Kong, but you can literally be an astronaut. A rock star or anything you want in America. We moved here believing an American dream. Los Angeles seemed like an easy choice for my family. My aunt and my grandparents had already immigrated and they had lived in LA for more than ten years. And my parents wanted my brother and me to go to USC or UCLA, both of which later rejected me. So fuck 'em. At least my brother is now a proud UCLA graduate. So the immigration wasn't a total loss for my parents. I was scared to leave the only place I'd known, but I couldn't wait to see all the massive mansions, fancy sports cars, and beautiful people that I'd seen in Hollywood movies. I thought I was going to be neighbors with Harrison Ford, Brad Pitt, and Jennifer Aniston. The first day my family got to Los Angeles, we visited my grandparents in Beverly Hills, but it wasn't anything fancy like I had expected from Beverly Hills. They lived in a quaint little four-unit apartment complex on the edge of town. We walked up some old, misshapen stairs to their unit. Coming from the skyscrapers in Hong Kong, I was very amused by this little two-story building. I had never been to anyone's home that didn't require taking an elevator. The apartment had a dull, dusty scent. It was some kind of old people stench. I used to call it grandpa smell. It was a small space, and my grandparents had put a familiar Chinese touch to it. From the kitchen to the living room, it was filled with Chinese newspapers, Chinese food, and furniture from China you'd never seen in other American households, like the small plastic stool that you squat on in the kitchen. People used it to prep the food on floor level. You can only find that in China. It was a classic Chinese immigrant's home where Chinese decor met American architecture. That day, Grandpa took my dad and me to his favorite restaurant in Los Angeles. I was ready for my very first American feast 
and I was excited to explore Tinseltown. Three generations of Chinese strolling down the beautiful streets of L.A. We walked down La Cienega Boulevard, a main artery of L.A. Every building we passed by was wide and short. In Hong Kong, every building was slim and at least 20 stories tall. That's the only way to cram 7 million people on an island the size of San Diego. It was nice to leave the concrete jungle and see the wide open California sky, but at the same time, Los Angeles felt a bit empty and lacking in humanity. There were only a few pedestrians on the streets. It was eerily empty compared to the human sardine can I was used to in Hong Kong. The streets were massive gray pavements with six lanes of traffic and a narrow sidewalk. This was definitely a town built for cars, not humans. We walked by a few strip malls with dreary dry cleaners and generic burger shops. I'd never seen a strip mall before. Every mall in Hong Kong was a monstrous shopping center that stretched vertically for multiple levels. These monotonous strip malls with flat white paint looked like the lonesome Wild West with the proverbial tumbleweed rolling by. Finally, we walked by a pizza hut, one of my favorite restaurants back in Hong Kong. And I asked Grandpa, Can we eat here? You can't eat here. There's nowhere to sit. I didn't realize this Pizza Hut was just a kitchen for pizza delivery. What a fraud! The Pizza Hut in Hong Kong was a nice sit-down restaurant with a swanky salad bar. You could order pizzas with shrimp, a fancy pie crust soup, and my favorite seafood pasta. This American version of a pizza oven inside of a hole in the wall was super jarring to me. How is the authentic version so much shittier than the foreign version? I felt betrayed, man. Fifteen minutes into our supposed ten-minute walk, I asked my grandpa in Shanghainese, Are we there yet? It's a universal saying amongst impatient children around the world in all languages. We're very close. Just a few more minutes. We ended up walking for 45 minutes in the sweltering dry heat of a Los Angeles summer. We finally arrived at our destination. It was the biggest strip mall yet. On one side, there was a huge two-story building called L.A. Fitness. I wasn't quite familiar with the concept of gyms yet. We didn't have corporate gyms in Hong Kong. Everyone was skinny. On the other side of the strip mall, there was a small glass building. Grandpa pointed to it and said, This is it. My favorite restaurant in L.A. It's authentic Mexican food. You don't have this in China. I looked up at the sign, El Pollo Loco. I had never heard of El Pollo Loco before. I didn't even know the name was in Spanish. I thought it was just three English words I hadn't learned yet. I was disappointed that a 45-minute hike ultimately ended in a fast food joint. But once we walked in, I realized this place was unlike any fast food restaurant I'd ever been to. I saw the biggest grill i ever seen in my life behind the registers, packed with rows of whole chicken, with a beautiful brownish-yellow tint. It smelled absolutely delicious. I looked through the glass panel, and I saw a cornucopia of sides. Rice, beans, mac and cheese, corn, and an interesting, weird green substance, which I later learned was called guacamole. My grandpa went up to order it in his Shanghainese English. Six pieces, dark meat. Then he turned around and explained to us in Shanghainese. They let you choose a which part of the chicken you want here. Dark meat and a white meat. Dark meat is the good parts. White meat is the breast. It's a dry and rough for American idiots. Grandpa's words of wisdom. To this day, I still only order dark meat. Then the cashier asked Grandpa, Flour or corn? Flour. And once again, he turned around and explained to us in Shanghainese, They give you these bread sheets to wrap your chicken in. Flour is good. The corn ones taste funny. After a college trip to Tijuana, I realized the corn ones didn't taste funny at all. They tasted authentic. I now strictly order corn tortillas. I'm sorry, Grandpa. Then Grandpa finished the order with three cups of water. He said to us, they make their money by overcharging you on soda. You can just get free water and fill it with whatever you want. 
My mind was fucking blown. You can pour your own soda here? And it's free? Wow. Jesus could turn water into wine, but in America, you could turn water into Dr. Pepper. What a beautiful country. Then, there was the salsa bar. What can I say about the salsa bar that hasn't been said about Disneyland? It was a magical kingdom of flavor and color. The El Pollo Local Salsa Bar exemplified American freedom. Land of the free, home of the salsa bar. Take whatever you want. It's free, Grandpa said to me. I thought he was messing with me. I looked at the salsa bar in front of me like a virgin staring at a naked Gigi Hadid. This can't be right. This is too good to be true. Grandpa noticed my hesitation and he nudged me forward. Go ahead. Take as much as you want. Take some home if you want to. What? Why would anyone ever want to buy onions and cilantro if it's all already finely chopped and free for the taking here in El Pollo Loco? If I had known what the word loco meant, I would have understood. There is so much freedom in this fast food joint. It's fucking loco. El Pollo Loco was the most American place I've ever been to. After stuffing ourselves full of dark meat and free salsa, we had to walk the same 45 minutes back to my grandpa's apartment. This was way before Uber. I was exhausted that night, but I couldn't sleep. My first day of American school was tomorrow, and the only thing I knew about America was El Pollo Loco. The first day I walked into John Burroughs Middle School, I felt like Andy Dufresne getting off the bus and walking into Shawshank Prison. John Burroughs was a middle school in the L.A. Unified School District that went from 6th to 8th grade. I was 13 years old, which placed me in the 8th grade and the last grade of the school, which meant I started in this school where everyone had already known each other for at least two years. It's always scary for a new kid to move to new school. And I was a foreign kid moving to a new school on a new continent. I was scared, confused, and anxious. A part of me wanted to keep to myself, but another part of me desperately wanted to make new friends. I was never shy with strangers, but this was an entirely different world. It was a different culture, a different language, and a different educational system. It was like I was transported to an alternate universe. Before classes started, I walked through the exercise yard where all the kids hang out. This would be what they called gen pop, a general population in prison. In Hong Kong, we only had Chinese kids in school. In John Burroughs, there were kids of every race, every religion, and every size. I had never interacted with white people, black people, or Hispanic people before. I didn't even know where to start. Then, I was relieved to see a group of Asian kids who looked like my friends back home. I walked up to him to introduce myself in my native tongue, but when I got close enough, I realized they were speaking Korean. I froze, and I walked away with my tail between my legs. My hopes were crushed. I soon realized that all the Asian kids in this school were Koreans. I wasn't racist. I just didn't know how to speak enough English to have a conversation yet. I had learned English in Hong Kong the way American high school kids learn Spanish. I knew some vocabulary words, but I couldn't carry a conversation. It felt like everyone was speaking way too fast. I was desperately hoping for some Chinese kids I could cling on to in this new school. In hindsight, this was a blessing in disguise. If I had gone to an American school with a lot of other Chinese kids, I would not have been forced to assimilate, and I would probably turn into the dude selling dim sum in Chinatown. So hey, thanks, Koreans. I made my way to the basketball courts. I was a pretty good basketball player back home, so I was hoping to show up some of my skills and earn some first-day respect. For a fleeting moment, Yao Ming blocked Shaquille O'Neal, and I thought I could be a baller in the NBA. But for the sobering fact that I was two feet too short. That's uh, still the case today. I really thought I could have made it. Then I saw Marquise. Marquise was an eighth grader who was 6'2", and looked like he was 25. He was a grown-ass man. As I walked towards the hoop, he ran by me in the blur and took off into the air for a monster slam dunk. My jaw dropped to the hot cement. I'd only seen NBA players do that on TV. 
You're telling me regular 13-year-old kids can do this in America? My mind could not comprehend the superhuman athleticism. I scurried off of the court without making eye contact with anyone. My hoop dreams were crushed. Marquise Dunk made me feel inadequate as a man. Before first period, I landed in something called the homeroom, a weird useless class that briefed the students before they went into their real classes. I still don't know why it's there. Before I even had a chance to settle into my seat, we're asked to rise up from our chairs. I'm not sure if I understood any of the instructions. I just followed what the other kids were doing. Everyone put their right hand on their chest and looked up to the American flag in front of the classroom. Then everyone started to chant. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I was lost. I looked around at my peers and I saw everyone all uniformly saying the same thing. I thought to myself, did I just join a cult or something? I had no idea what those words meant. I just pretended to move my lips so I didn't seem out of place. It was a nerve-wracking two minutes for me. I hadn't met any of my classmates yet, and I didn't want anyone to notice the foreign kid wasn't doing something that everyone else was doing. All I wanted to do was fit in, but the Pledge of Allegiance made me feel more foreign than ever. Finally, everybody sat down, and I breathed a sigh of relief. Unknowingly, that was the moment I became an American. Next, the teacher did a roll call. Oh, good, I thought. This is something I can handle. We did roll calls back in Hong Kong, too. How different can this be? The older white lady teacher started to call out the names. Marcus Johnson, here. Susie Kim, here. Man, she... Ooh, ooh, ah. The rest of the class looked around for this unfamiliar newcomer. I raised my hand before she could butcher my name any further. Here, you can call me Jimmy. I nervously looked around the room and I saw everyone whispering to each other, discussing this new little Chinese boy. The teacher said, Welcome, Jimmy. I certainly didn't feel very welcome. Physical education was the first period after homeroom. P.E. had always been my favorite class in Hong Kong. Even though I looked like a tiny nerd, I had always gravitated to his sports. I might never be able to dunk like Marquise, but I was confident that I could train some three-pointers and score me some new friends. After all, how different could P.E. class be in America? Before hitting the field in P.E., we had to go to the locker room to change into our gym clothes. I had never changed in front of other people before, so I waited until everyone else took off their pants before I did. I had made myself as invisible as possible and tried to change faster than a new fish taking a prison shower. I wasn't trying to take any chances. Then a kid next to me laughed out loud and pointed at me and he said, Are you wearing tidy whities Dude, that's fucking gay! Everyone looked over and started laughing at me. I couldn't have been more embarrassed by my tidy whities fresh out of Hong Kong. I hopped into my gym shorts as quickly as possible. Then the same kid screamed out, Pull down your shorts, man! I was so confused. I just put them on. What do you mean pull them down? I stared at him blankly and said, What? He blurted out again, much more insistent this time, Pull down your pants, man! I looked around and everyone was seemingly agreeing with him. I went into full panic mode. Am I about to get booty raped like they show in the American prison movies? Is this how they initiate new kids in the Los Angeles public school district? Shit. I didn't know what to do, so I slowly pulled down my gym shorts as instructed. And as they got past my knees, the kid said, Yo, what the fuck are you doing? Don't pull it down all the way. Just sag it. I looked at him, befuddled, with my shorts halfway down my legs. Then he pointed to his own shorts. Sag your pants a little so you don't look like a fucking nerd. Nobody pulls their pants all the way up. I had no idea what he was talking about. I just blindly followed his instructions to pull my shorts halfway down my butt to showcase a little bit of my tidy whities I later learned that sagging was an American trend from the hip-hop community. Rappers would wear loose pants hanging halfway down their ass so they could look like a cool gangster who just got out of prison. Every kid in America started doing it too. Pulling your shorts all the way up 